morning. My name is Erica Brinker, and I'm the co-chair of the Community, Government, and Education Committee, and an alumni of the Leadership Challenge Program. Welcome to the 2021 Blowing Rock Candidates Forum, hosted and produced by the alumni of the Blowing Rock Chamber of Commerce's Leadership Challenge Program, in partnership with the Community, Government, and Education Committee. The Candidates Forum was started by the Leadership Challenge Charter Class back in 2007, as a service to the voters and residents of Blowing Rock. It has been sustained by the ever-growing number of graduates from the Leadership Challenge program. We now have 99 graduates. The Blowing Rock, yeah, round of applause. Blowing Rock Leadership Challenge is an exciting eight-week program offered every two years, which gives the participants an in-depth study of all the inner workings of our town and community. It is designed to motivate, challenge, and equip the participants for leadership opportunities in our community. If you're interested in the Leadership Challenge or know of a good candidate for the program, please let Charles Harden know. The next class will begin in March of 2022, and we have applications available for anyone interested. Thank you all for being here as well. It shows that you care about what happens in our town and to our town. We believe we have a program this evening that will be informative, stimulating, and possibly entertaining. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank First Baptist Church of Blowing Rock for donating the fresh popcorn you all are enjoying. And Ben and Owen Parker, big round of applause for these gentlemen for providing entertainment as we all arrived. We also want to recognize Jeff O'Brien for all his hard work on the renovation of this auditorium and his continued involvement in the school. Uh, Rigid AV is operating the sound and lights for this evening's forum, so let's give a round of applause to them as well. Okay, for our moderators this evening, we have Chelsea Garrett and Billy Chick. Billy is a graduate of the leadership class of 2017. He is a native of Hawaii, and his wife Jennifer and him moved here in 2014. He is a CFP for Edward Jones Investments. And since moving to Blowing Rock, he has been very active in the chamber, serving on its board for five years and one year as chairman of the board. Chelsea Garrett is a resident of Blowing Rock and is currently the co-chairperson of the Community, Government, and Education Committee. She has served on the chamber board previously as vice chair. Chelsea is a partner with Dasani, Capua, and Garrett law firm. Her and her husband, Rob, and their two sons love Blowing Rock and its unique people. Without further ado, please welcome Chelsea and Billy. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. It's nice to see everybody together. You know, we haven't been able to do that for a while, so thank you for being able to join us tonight. So, so let's begin. All right. All right. So before we get started with questions, if each of you would like to take up to three minutes, you may, to make an opening statement. I'll start with you, Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. <laughs> well played. <laughs> you know, I uh, love Blowing Rock. Growing up here, it's been a special town, and it's still a very special town. In the past four years, we've seen a lot of improvements in our community. We saw the completion of Highway 321 that J.B. Lawrence and our former mayor and other council members had addressed for many years. We planted new trees in Memorial Park. We renovated Memorial Park, which that renovation is ongoing. We have now completed 90% of the paving that was needed to be done in our town. And that's from the 2014 referendum. We brought back police service to our downtown seven days a week. We have a police resource officer here at our school that the uh, council voted and approved. We now have a part-time ambulance service and striving for 24-7. We've campaigned for crosswalk signage at Sunset, Maine, 221 in Maine. It's coming, it's ordered, and it's on its way. We continue the construction on Bass Lake. Hopefully, before I end up at Foley Center, it'll be completed. <laughs> we, we approved a long-awaited pay structure for our employees. We approved the re renovation of our water treatment plant and pollution control facility. 
We persevered over COVID and we will make it. We're all strong, smart, and we're moving forward. We hired one of the best town managers any town could have, Mr. Shane Fox. And I wanna thank all of you as citizens for all that you've done for the town, whether you're individually or an organization. We all have to work as one, one for Blowing Rock. Thank you very much. I just did that. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Melissa, if you'd like to take the next. I'm supposed to follow that? <laughs> it's not my rules, Melissa. Yeah, He's had a lot more practice. Did, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, for those who don't know me, I'm Melissa Pickett. I've been in Blowing Rock for the past 20 years. Um, my husband and I had the Blowing Rock in until this past January. And I guess, for lack of a better term, I have been using I am semi-retired since then. Um, I'm now a full-time resident of Blowing Rock, which I've been the whole 20 years, but that's all I am now. So um, my favorite passion in life is volunteering. So for those of you who do know me, I take this to the fullest extent in life. I serve on like six boards and committees. I'm constantly in the middle of something. So I have decided to put that to good use and put it where I love the most, my town. So I don't think there's anything wrong with our town. I think it's a wonderful town. I just want to be useful. So that is why I'm running for council. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> Pete Garini, would you like thank to go you. next? Thank you very much. And thank you to Charles and the chamber staff, board members, for putting this on. It's very important that citizens of this town get to hear what the candidates are gonna say and the positions that they're gonna take. So I am Pete Garini. I'm a full-time resident. I serve currently on the planning board where I'm chairman. Also serve on the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee with uh, our mentor out there, David Harwood, who gives us leadership or direction. Um, I've been involved in local, state, federal politics for a long time. I've learned a lot along the way. I've had mentors that have helped me. Um, my expertise is in community development, education, tourism, to name but a few. It's my intent to, if you all consider electing me, to bring new energy, leadership, and the ability to get things done working with our mayor and certainly our town manager, who I think does a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Nancy Pitts Collins. Thank you, Mr. Harden and the Bornock Chamber for hosting the 2021 Candidate Forum. This is the first opportunity that I have had to be with all of the candidates because we had other family obligations. But my name is Nancy Pitts Collins. I was, I was born here, I'm a native of Blowing Rock. I'm the fourth child of former Mayor Hayden and Betty, Miss Betty Pitt. Um, service was introduced to us at an early age and I attended Blowing Rock Elementary, Watauga High School, Cape Fear Community College. I married uh, Tom Collins because my parents wouldn't let us drink and I had to be happy. <laughs> so that's why I married a Tom Collins, oh, he's great. Uh, but we were married at Rumpel we're the proud parents of four uh, grandchildren and three, gr three children. Uh, we were away for 24 years because service called us out of Blowing Rock, Tom with North Carolina Emergency Management and me with North Carolina Department of Transportation and the North Carolina Department of Highway Patrol. Uh, most weekends we stayed at home when, when we could come back, but I retired from the Highway Patrol in March of 2020 and COVID hit. So we came home to serve, but we really haven't been able to serve. But I was asked by several citizens to, to um, run for town council. So I again heard the call for service. I feel that it's imperative to find a right balance for preservation and growth while keeping the citizens of our beautiful town foremost in, in our minds. And being away for those years, I was able to witness with my own eyes the detrimental growth that can happen to a town. 
when people are divided. So there are many actions that need to be addressed. Um, we'll go into that later. But one thing that I really want to think about are our children. Children growing up in Blowing Rock and what a great place it is. And we need families in Blowing Rock because when you don't have children, things die. So we need, we need growth. Um, I feel that our town has become fragmented because of the different um, special interest groups. And we can all work together and come to one accord if we will just do that. It's my opinion that the citizens of our town are allowed to elect officials to govern and to set policies, and therefore they need to allow our wonderful town manager to manage the town, what he's called to do, and he's done a great job at that. Well, anyway, that is Nancy Collins. I'm running because I love Blowing Rock. This is my home, and I want it to be even better than it is right now. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> Doug Matheson, would you like to take a moment? <laughs> uh, I also echo uh, what everybody else said. Thank you, Chamber, and thank everyone else for being here. Since Charlie has stole all the thunder from everything that we have done the past few years, I guess I'll just go with introducing myself and telling you a little about myself. Uh, I was raised here in Bourne Rock, went to Bourne Rock Elementary, graduated with Tauga High School. I retired from Appalachia State University after 38 years as a plumber. Um, we have three children, seven grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. I'm married to the lovely Miss Barbara Brown. Uh, I passed, served on Blown Rock Parks and Rec. I was past president of Blown Rock PTO. Uh, I'm retired from the Blown Rock Volunteer Fire Department with 30 years in. I retired at the rank of chief when I left there. Right now, I currently serve on Watauga County Parks and Rec. Uh, I sit on the board of directors for High Country Council of Governments, and I was elected last year as an at-large director for the board of directors for North Carolina League of Municipalities. So I'm trying to stay out there and stay active in promoting Boyne Rock as much as I can. I thank you all again for being here, and let's get down to business. All right. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, well, I'll let Chelsea go ahead and ask the first question then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for introducing yourselves. It's really great to have you here. Um, as you know, um, it was difficult to narrow down the topics um, to five questions um, for this part of the evening. The first question, um, therefore, touches on a few issues that are not touched on more at length than the other questions. And you can pick one. Those issues include, or some examples, labor shortages since COVID started and actually prior to COVID, an increase in need from our community food bank, short-term rentals in R1 neighborhoods, and a designated emergency transportation ambulance service for Blowing Rock. So if you could please think for a moment, pick one issue, tell us why you picked it, and how you plan to tackle it, including, for example, through what funding sources, code revisions, or other means. I'll let whoever is ready to go first start, and then I can, um, they'll have two minutes, and I can pick um, the next candidate for a one minute response. Would you like to go, Pete? Yeah, I'll right. take parking. Okay. Well, we oh. do have a question on that later, but you can go ahead and touch on it. I just want to mention that. Touch on? Parking, we have a question on okay, in a few so minutes. Okay, so pick something else, or? Well, if you could pick one of the ones I mentioned, I'll mention those again. Labor shortages since COVID started, an increase in need from our community food bank, short-term rentals in R1 neighborhoods, designated emergency transportation or ambulance service. And if you feel compelled to talk about parking, you're welcome to, and just expound upon it later. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I'll take uh, the ambulance service. Okay. We all know that uh, the issue of ambulance service to this town has been going on for some time. 
and it's just recently that the uh, Blowing Rock Civic Association had a gathering of about 80 people that came to uh, the Blowing Rock Country Club and talked about everything that was going on. It was a presentation by the mayor, by uh, Shane Fox, our town manager, and it was evident that there's still going to be some problems with getting this done. I think everybody wants it, but the devil is in the details. And that by mean, by that I mean, first of all, it's controlled by the county, okay? It's mandated by the legislature that they have the ability to tax and to do all the stuff that they're doing. In order to get this done, we're simply going to have to begin to work together. And I know Shane is working with the manager down there uh, to try and get a better fix on what we're going to do. So the split that we're paying to the county and what we get back in return is not a good return. The time that it takes an ambulance to get to Blowing Rock is probably anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. That same service in, in uh, Boone is probably five to nine minutes. So we're paying a lot of money to the county to get that done, but we're not getting the benefit of it. So I would suggest that we have a lot of work ahead of us, but I'm working with the mayor and <coughs> uh, Shane Fox. I'm sure we can get it done. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Who would like to address that question next? And you can pick the same issue and respond to Pete, or you can um, pick another issue I mentioned. Go ahead, Nancy. Um, the ambulance service. In 1974, we established the ambulance service. And it was great. We had volunteers. But the thing that happened, it got so expensive to live in Blowing Rock, all of our volunteers moved away. But we have really qualified firemen that are EMTs, and some of them are even higher levels, paramedics. And they can get there. If, if Blowing Rock, I mean, we're paying the taxes for the county already, and if Blowing Rock... Um, would just get like a quick response unit that would be housed at the fire department. That would be cheaper. And our paramedics would be able to sustain, sustain um, that person's tragedy or whatever is going on at that moment until the ambulance gets there. Because if we have a permanent ambulance space here, if the one leaves out of Boone, it has to, you have to, um, I'm sorry. Okay, you can take a minute to if finish. One leaves out, if, if the ambulance leaves out of Boone, what happens, this, out, this ambulance would leave and have to go to standby in Boone. So we want, we're not guaranteed 24 hours a day with an ambulance service. Thank you, Nancy. Um, would one of the other candidates like to speak to one of those issues? Mayor? In 2017, <clears throat> I ran for mayor. I addressed a 24-7 transport. 2015, uh, excuse me, 2015, 2017, 2019, and here we are, 2021. It is time that Watauga County works with the town of Blowing Rock. We need transport. We don't, the, the citizens deserve it here. We deserve it. Our fire district deserves it. I feel like, the, okay, maybe the taxpayers should pay a little additional, but I do not think that it should be totally, or the taxpayers should be totally obligated to pay the fee for transport. So, Doug, would you like to expand on that? Melissa, she had okay, her hand. Melissa. Dan, go ahead, because I'm going to be unusual and talk about one of the other subjects. So. Okay, uh, I'll just expand a, a little bit on the ambulance service. Uh, Right now, we currently serve uh, and subsidize the EMS system already that we're getting from the county on the paramedic level. Uh, we also furnish them a place over at our fire department to put the ambulance and to house the crew. Uh, so we're already subsidizing a lot of this already from, uh, to the county. It is something that, unless most people want, don't feel like I would like to raise taxes to pay for something that we're already paying for. Uh, 
I would love to see the county, they need to finally decide that they need to expand their ambulance services out into the county, not only just the Bowen Rock, uh, they need to expand it throughout the whole county. It, it's so antiquated, their, their, their system is now, it needs to be updated quite a bit. Thank you, Doug. Um, go ahead, Melissa, I think you haven't gone yet. Okay. Um, if, if someone else wants to go on the ambulance, because I'm going to move to a different subject. Well, everybody's actually had um, had a moment to respond. So if you'd like to take another issue and respond on this first question, and then we can potentially have some follow-up. Okay. I'm going to uh, be my normal self and go to something else that no one else has talked about yet. So I'm going to address the short-term rentals, which is another hot topic in our town for us. Um, I know it's a well-known thing right now that this is in the budget discussions, which I know coming from me, this is gonna sound weird, that even I think it's weird to have provisions in a financial document, but it's out there. So we have amazing ordinances in our town to protect our neighborhoods from short-term rentals. <clears throat> and I believe right now we need to keep focusing with our town staff, Shane's been doing this all along, our council mayor has, and working with our state level to make sure that there are ways to protect our ordinances. We need to make sure we're talking to our representative, our senator, that has now moved up to going to the governor because it is now in his office, the budget is. So we need to really concentrate on that and make sure that we can work. I believe there is the potential to get wording put in that will protect the ordinances we already have in effect. So. Thank you, Melissa. Um, just as a follow-up to that rental topic, um, for the rentals that may be legally permitted to continue, maybe they're grandfathered, for example, even though we do have an ordinance that addresses them, um, would you be in favor of requiring um, the owners of those properties to have local property managers um, that can be reached um, in order to um, better enforce our ordinance so our town staff can enforce our ordinance and the neighbors can have somebody that can address issues that arise? You're referring to the ones that are permitted in commercial district. I'm referring to any short-term rentals. Any short-term rentals, would you be in favor of having a local property manager that was accessible as opposed to, for example, a, only a VRBO or Airbnb situation where there's not anybody to call when there's a noise issue at one o'clock in the morning? I don't think that legally you can outlaw VRBO and Airbnb, so making that a town rule I'm going to say I'm, that you would have to look into that. Mm -hmm. I believe that comes down to a legal issue because I don't believe that we can ban VRBO and Airbnb from our town. Right, right. They, um, you can um, possibly make them list, if they go that measure, we could possibly write an ordinance where they have to list a contact for that, but right. I don't believe we can ban them from our town. Right. No, I would agree, um, and I think that's a, a, a good suggestion that they have a local contact. Um, so um, as to the ambulance question, um, I believe that several of you mentioned um, the fact that we have a, a quick, re or you'd suggest a quick response team, that we've had that before, correct? No, we had an actual ambulance service here. I mean, the EMS. Flood, but what I was saying, the quick response, that's just one unit that isn't as expensive to uh, outfit as an ambulance would be but they would be able to use that and it would have a lot of the things that the ambulance would have on it that they could use until the ambulance could get there to can, get there. Can I, person. oh, sorry. Well, I was just gonna ask, do you have any suggestions, you or uh, Doug or any other candidates regarding how to fund that? I would like to see, that's another thing that I would like to see the county, if they're not gonna put an ambulance over here, subsidize paramedics in all the fire departments in the county. At least you have a quick response, mm -hmm. a paramedic, and they can be there prepping you, getting you ready while the ambulance is en route. But, you know, for now, the, the time being, you know, the county needs to, like I said, step up to the plate. But if they would subsidize even a paramedic level in all departments in the county. Um, Pete, I believe you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe ask Doug, help me understand, and all of us, um, we have the best or, uh, fire people at the fire station that anybody could want. You get hurt or something happens to you and our guys get there, you're in really good shape. 
It's what happens when you're transported from here down to Wataga. And my question, Doug, since you got all the expertise with the county down there, how is it that Wataga Medics continues to have sort of an unlimited contract that when it comes up for renewal, they keep getting it renewed. Isn't there supposed to be some mechanism where it goes out for bid? So I think it would be appropriate at the end when we're having questions from the audience. Um, we can revisit that question. Okay. Only, Pete, so that we can keep going. Um, but if we could, if you want to make a note of that one, yeah. um, and then, Doug, if you'd like to follow up with regard to that contract and how it keeps getting renewed okay. without bids. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. Um, I'll let Billy ask the next question, and it, it touches upon um, Nancy's point about the fact that years ago there was an EMS, um, there were EMS um, locally, and that um, many of them had to leave because they couldn't afford to live here. Did you have anything? Yeah. I want to first say that property values have probably gone up a lot since 1974, haven't they? Yeah. Um, so a challenge that we've seen over the years, and I've heard personally by being on the chamber board, is that it's hard for it's hard for businesses here in, in the community to uh, find employees, retain employees, um, because these employees it may have to be traveling from Lenore or the outskirts of Boone or you know just maybe 45 minutes to an hour away, and it's very difficult for them. Um, so the question is, Blowing Rock is unique and largely in a, in, in a largely privileged community as well. However, much of our local work, uh, workforce um, of varying income levels cannot afford to live here, unfortunately. So the question is, do you view this a matter of public concern, warranting public funding and regulatory measures to address or not? If so, how do you propose the town council should have a role in addressing this particular issue? So Charlie, um, actually, actually, whoever. We'll start with Doug, I think he's ready, and then we'll okay. come back down. Okay. You have okay. two minutes. The housing <laughs> workforce, you know, it really isn't usually sub subsidized by small towns. Uh, what we try and do here, or ways that you can do it, is you try and, and make sure you pay a competitive wage, something that helps them be able to afford their, their rent, you know, or, or their house payment. Uh, you try and offer developers uh, incentives you know, uh, maybe tap on fees, uh, waive the fees to try and encourage uh, developers to to build a low middle income housing. Uh, the property values, you're right, the property values in Blowing Rock are so high, it, it makes it so hard for anybody to do that type of housing in, in, inside Blowing Rock. Right now, the best way to do it is, is work to, toward your county and a lot of uh, places now are finding out they can take the ARP money and help that to subsidize housing for your workforce. So, you know, it, it, the best thing to do is try and, and work with your county into getting, you know, getting them to use some of that money toward uh, housing out inside the county where it's a little more affordable. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Nancy, if you want to go next. I agree with Doug. I mean, we can't make more land. We can't make cheaper land. And we just have to do as Doug said, I agree with you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Pete, if you want to go next. Yeah, I, I might have a little different approach. Um, and first I would say, one of the most valuable resources this town has is its employees. We should not ever forget that because these people come to work, and I know there's been discussions about the mandates and everything, but, you know, when our maintenance crews are out at 2 o'clock in the morning fixing water and sewer, I don't know where you find uh, a garbage truck driver or uh, people to work maintenance. And so I, I think that you might want to consider, or I would certainly look at, private partnership, private public partnerships. If developers are gonna come in and start doing big projects, maybe we need to have them start funding some of this. Thank you, Doug. Um, Thank you, Pete. 
Um, Pete, sorry. <laughs> Doug, Pete, Pete Doug. Or the same. Um, <laughs> Melissa or Mayor, uh, which one of you would like to go next? No, uh, go ahead, Melissa. <laughs> I would somewhat be in agreement with Pete that public private partnerships, <clears throat> unfortunately, nobody wants to hear it, but government cannot fix this. I mean, it's nobody ever wants to hear government say that, but it's not a fix government can do. But I do believe putting groups together and coming up with public-private partnerships is the best solution that can come out of that. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Carla? Mayor? I'll make it quick. Back in the day, your larger facilities here had their own housing. The Green Park had their own housing, the Mayview Manor. Uh, the, uh, gosh, what was the restaurant? Um, Onion. The farmhouse. They all housed their own employees. Same scenario, there wasn't any affordable housing here. I agree with Doug, I agree with the rest of the, the members here that uh, this is gonna be a county issue. This is a county issue. And then what we need to do is how do we figure out, okay, if we've got people outside of the county, how can we get them into town to work? Maybe we need to look at transport as well. Um, by way of follow up, and any one of you can answer this, um, one of you, I think uh, it was Doug uh, and Nancy agreed that one option was to explore um, uh, looking at incentivizing um, developers to consider more middle and lower income housing options. Um, a number of towns have um, incorporated um, ordinances requiring that depending on the project being proposed, a certain percentage of it is dedicated um, and must be priced. Um, at a level that is affordable to whatever is deemed to be the workforce um, wage. Um, there are other ways to incentivize, so not necessarily fund with a subsidy and money, but to, um, to make it more feasible um, for developers to come in and get projects approved that include housing that is more affordable. So would you be in favor of amending the development ordinance um, to provide for, um, for that? Any one of you can answer. Also, I looked at, and I also looked at, you know, the possibility of the town maybe being able to afford the land or buy the land and then working with the developer. Mm -hmm. So the public-private partnership example. Right. You're, you're, you're back at that again with, mm -hmm. you know, as, as another way. But uh, developers, and right now, like I said, at the price of the property, it's, not feasible. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, I, I would just further to what Doug was saying. Uh, as chairman of the planning board, I see what's coming. And I mean, Charlie and Shane and everybody else knows that too, but there's going to be a time where we just tell people that are coming here that there's, there's an entry price to, to coming to this wonderful place. We want to keep it a wonderful place, but we have needs, we have parking needs, we have the housing need, we have infrastructure needs. And some people might say, you know, the taxpayers shouldn't be having all that burden on them. So let's look at the possibility of uh, joint public partnerships to do that. Okay. Thank you, Pete. <clears throat> For our third question, we're addressing the issues um, which arose in a number of um, proposed questions from the community uh, and from the chamber board, uh, and that issue is um, uh, overcrowding and or parking. So overcrowding and parking were the topics of many proposed questions submitted, especially um, and have been discussed within our community for years. Recently, after further study by consultants, we are told that we have more of a parking problem than an overcrowding problem. A tourism management plan is being developed by consultants and will identify possible locations for parking structures. Do you agree that we have more of a parking than overcrowding problem? And where do you believe are practical locations for parking and how should it be funded? <laughs> Go ahead. No, you're a senior, you got senior. <laughs> Just cause I'm old, you don't have to <laughs> always point to me, you know. Delegation, Doug. <laughs> 
I, it's nice to say that we do have a parking problem. Uh, I mean, I, I would rather see us have that problem than I remember some of the lean years here when we didn't have that problem. And, and so it is, it, it is a problem that even though it is a huge inconvenience for a lot of people, it is nice to have. Uh, the town is looking at a uh, piece of property uh, of doing some satellite parking. Uh, one of the main things about, we'd love to see move the people, uh, we're looking at maybe a graduate, what I would like to see is a, a graduated system uh, that parking is charged for, and the closer you get to Main Street, the more you pay for the parking. That helps pay for, you know, should we decide to do a parking deck. But the closer you get to Main Street, the more you're going to pay in parking. The further away. This will encourage, you know, like uh, employees. Uh, maybe offer them a discount in your satellite parking. Offer them a discount rate to park there. But in order to get a lot of the parking done, we've got to set up some type of shuttle or public transit system. Uh, these employees coming into town or, or even just your customers coming into town, they need to know that when I get on this bus, I'm going to be 15 minutes and I'm off of it, you know. They need to know that they have a dedicated service that if I get here at a quarter of 10, my shop opens at 10, the bus is going to be there to take me from the parking to Main Street. Uh, so one of the, the things that we really need to address there is get that up and running before we can really seriously move into satellite parking or another parking deck, you know. Uh, a lot of that money, like I said, would be funded through uh, the TDA and, like I said, along with your, uh, the price that you charge for parking. Thank you, Doug. Yeah, just to amplify what <clears throat> Doug said, it's time to start charging for parking. And on Main Street, Sunset, the parking garage, anywhere where the town has access for parking, start charging for it. And the charge and the money that is generated from that, don't put that money into the general fund, set it aside into a parking fund that will then go to help buy the properties that Doug has mentioned and I think maybe Charlie had mentioned it before. It's just time to start doing this. And um, some of the biggest violators of parking downtown, real estate people, retail people, people that take up space, and that's why there's no, no spaces. So, uh, and I would then say it's important that we make residents, we give them the opportunity to have a tag, a discounted tag to park downtown. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mr. You. Pete. Would anyone like to address that question? I know you don't want to repeat what's been said, so. Uh, may I? Of course. Okay, uh, speaking about the parking, what about, I mean, when we have all of these heavy times, where are our police officers? Can they not issue citations for the, the cars that have been parked there too long? I think it, it's kind of scary thinking about a parking deck being built on 321 and thinking about the people that would be crossing that highway, US 321. I mean, I handled fatalities with the North Carolina State Highway Patrol. And the people that were, the pedestrians that were killed from vehicles was astronomical. So that worries me. But, you know, I don't think it's fair to to label the merchants or the real estate personnel um, as being the bad guys for parking. Um, there needs to be a happy medium somewhere. Okay. Thank you, Maxie. Thank you. Anybody else want to take May the I? question, Max? Yes. No. Or sir? Okay, I think, uh, first off, uh, I did get a parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot help you with that. I got a loan and paid it. <laughs> They do give them, at least I got one. I think maybe I had this bullseye on the back. You the example. <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing work for the chamber at the time. Um, okay. Satellite parking is a good idea, but we have to offer transport. And not every hour. It has to be more frequent, as Doug and others have mentioned. Uh, so people don't put their lives in jeopardy. Um, 
signage. You know, my wife and I worked the Rumpel parking lot for one of the uh, 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 Art in the Parks. People did not realize there was a parking area down at Devant Field. There's, so not only are we looking at parking, but we need to improve our signage, our wayfinding, and uh, I think that's a must. But I do think we need additional parking. I do agree. Charging for parking is, is good um, moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a couple follow-ups. I don't know, Melissa, if you have anything else you wanted to add to what's been said. No, I pretty much in agreement. We have a parking issue. We need satellite parking. I, I do I do have a follow-up question uh, in regards to this. So uh, it's been mentioned that the town may purchase a property. It's also been mentioned that uh, charging for parking as well. Um, my, my first follow-up question is how would, well, and also the meters as well, the meters are charging for parking will solve for part of the revenue to purchase that land, right? Um, how will this piece of property or parking structure, how will that be funded? Will that be by an increase in tax dollars? Um, any thoughts on how that revenue is gonna be generated? And part of it could be by charging for parking. Um, but my thoughts are it's probably gonna be a pretty large amount to purchase this property and build the structure. Thoughts on that? Go for it, Pete. Well, I don't know if the mayor and the council or <clears throat> The uh, town manager talked about it, but the property there at the Bluffs near Food Lion, I mean, that would seem to be property that if the parking is going to go on 321 down near the fire station, why not sell that property and use that money to, to make a down payment or to help uh, minimize the uh, parking number? Another I'm sorry, Thank another you, Pete. form of pain possibly is applying for grants. I mean, there are grants that are, are available that we could consider. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Anything else, Doug? Uh, well, uh, I, I covered this before. Is the TDA actually pretty much paid for our last two parking structures? So we, it wasn't really paid for with our tax dollars. Okay. It was paid through... Uh, the TDA and Mr. Tracy Brown back there. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Thank um, you, Doug. Before we move on to uh, the next question, which we'll, Billy will ask, I would just ask that anybody that has a proposed question, uh, raise their hand and the volunteers can come around and grab it from you. Um, that way they can get them up to us in time. Thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. <clears throat> This next question is in regards to town infrastructure, okay? Um, so town infrastructure and sustainability uh, development involve a myriad of issues that require both short-term remedies and long-term planning to address. Examples being water runoff issues, bearing utilities on Main Street, uh, promoting green initiatives like the green space requirements and allowing obscured solar panels in R1, which are currently prohibited and expanding fiber connections to neighborhoods that don't have it right now. Um, <clears throat> to pick one, since 2014, the town's top priorities in the strategic plan has been to move the overhead utilities on Main Street uh, underground. The water and sewer mains running under Main Street are scheduled to be replaced soon in 2022, beginning in 2022, which require Main Street, Main Street's gonna have to be dug up at that time. Um, and it's unlikely to occur for many years after that to be dug up again. So the question here is, do you agree that moving or undergrounding utilities should be a top priority? And is this, time, is this the time to put the overhead utilities underground since a portion of the cost to do so is, is uh, being paid for by the digging up of Main Street already? Um, are you willing to pursue funding to cover the remaining, remaining expenses involved with burying the utility lines on Main Street? So. Anybody goes first. Okay. Oh. Put your hand. Right. You've be a gentleman, first. Pete. Exactly. Be a, be I think the ladies, <laughs> the ladies get the, the, shot, the first shot of the next two questions. So no. Nancy, go ahead. Okay. In my opinion, Loin Rock is absolutely the most beautiful town in this state, and we have been throughout this whole state. And how many people really look at those power lines? I mean, do you really think that they need to be buried, and does that need to be an expense? 
that the town of Blowing Rock really needs to do at this time. Um, I, I mean, we deal with hurricanes and, and snowstorms and everything else, and I think our funding could be used better than because it's going to be extremely expensive to bury the, the cables, and how in the world would we fund it? I mean, I really don't know because it would be very expensive. Thank you, Nancy. Fair point. Go on. Go. It's a gentleman. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pick on you people. <laughs> That's okay. Um, <clears throat> I would say that this is another one of those, I call them the aha at the end of the rainbow projects. Everybody wants it, it would be beautiful. I do agree the timing is unbelievable with us doing the water and sewer project on Main Street. My concern is the funding. Um, I do know there is a committee that is looking into the pricing of it. I know in the past, the town has been given a $15 million price tag for this project. I believe $15 million is undoable for our small town. Um, if the committee could come back and say that it can be done for less, even if it's just putting the conduit in right now, it could be done for less. Funding could be found reasonably. I believe it could be a doable project. Okay. But at $15 million, no way. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Pete, I believe it's your turn now. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, <laughs> you, sir. <laughs> Listen, folks, this is a no-brainer. I mean, you're going to tear up the street, and you're going to repair the water and sewer while you have the street dug up, why wouldn't you start looking at putting all these wires underground? I, I've heard the numbers. I think that between the federal government, <clears throat> excuse me, the federal government, the state, there are grants. I'll bet there's even utility companies that would trip, chip in money because they don't want to have the lines in the middle of winter when it's snowing and freezing to have to deal with that. So I wouldn't dismiss the fact that there's a high price tag on it. Let's look at that and see if we can cut that down. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. May I? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Blowing Rock is one of the few towns in the high country that still has power lines above ground. We will be historic. People will travel here to see our power lines. <laughs> hey, that, this is a good thing. Okay, that being said, <laughs> I'm on, I am one on the group that's looking at alternatives for the utilities. There's a lot of infrastructure involved in putting the utilities underground. That's what makes it so expensive. And, uh, but this group that's headed up by the chamber is looking at alternatives for the utility lines, because it's not just Blue Ridge Electric, it's also AT&T, it's SkyBest, it's Spectrum. But once you work with one, you got to work with the other ones. And it took us two years to get the telephone lines off of uh, 321. But it is being worked on. It could be doable. We'll see what uh, the Chambers group comes back with. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. I have one follow-up to that. Um, I believe that uh, it was either Pete or Melissa mentioned it. Um, that uh, th one suggestion is um, as a stopgap until the funds can be raised, um, to uh, have an initial outlay uh, to lay conduit while the streets are open and then revisit funding for actually burying the lines uh, that are above ground. Would you be in favor of aggressively pursuing that initial outlay so that in the future, sooner than 50 years, it would be possible to put these utility lines underground? Doug? That would be worth looking into, uh, you know, you do it kind of like you do uh, a main water line, because you, you would go ahead and set your taps up. Um, another cost that you have to, that the town has to consider is the cost that will also be passed on to the businesses on Main Street that once new wiring is put in, they may end up having to change their panels, they may have to change their wiring. Some of the business may may have to rewire their whole business because their wiring will not fit with the new wiring coming in. You know, so it's not going to be just the town's expense when you start thinking about 
taking the, the wires and moving them underground, then you start thinking about the businesses and their expense that they're going to incur in all this also. Yes, I'm done. One of the Go things ahead. the committee is looking at is the hybrid scenario of the utilities. Some on Main Street, but majority back behind the buildings, which saves the business owners and those people on Main Street because if the power lines come from the top down, there's no additional fees incurred. If they come from the bottom up, that's when the businesses incur additional fees. So that's part of what this group is working on, how they do a hybrid program uh, that's cost effective to the uh, taxpayers. Thank you, Charlie. Mayor, um, we are um, upon our fifth question. So last call for questions from the audience. If you'd find a volunteer, if you have one, that'd be great. So the last question, we want to thank you for both having the courage to run for public office and serve our community. But as with any elected official, your sphere and time of influence is at the pleasure of the voters. In comparison, the town staff and department heads are hired for their expertise to do a specific job and in at least some positions, our town has been very fortunate to have these employees for the long term, and their institutional knowledge can be priceless. Being an effective leader is not easy and requires as much restraint as it does initiative. Even well-intended elected leaders can fall into a trap of micromanaging and overstepping their roles, which can lead to low morale and low employee, employee retention rates. My question is, what do you view the purpose and responsibilities of the town council are as compared to the town staff and employees' responsibilities. Melissa, if you want to take this, you, this is your. Go ahead, Melissa. Oh, yeah, <laughs> now you don't want to talk. <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> First, I will say that after being here for 20 years, I will start out with saying that I 100% believe we have an amazing town staff from Shane all the way down um, to everybody who works in public works, parks and rec, all of them are amazing. But my personal opinion, if, if I was a town council member, my job is to help set policy and procedures. The council hires Shane to be our town manager and run our town. Staff works for Shane, and Shane is in control of the staff. They are an invaluable source to the council members. I spent time last week getting ready for the interviews we did on Friday into the night. I spent time in Shane's office on the phone with him. I talked to Kevin Rothrock. I mean, they're an invaluable source. There is no way sitting on council that you can know everything there is to know about the town. That is why our department heads and Shane are invaluable to council members. And it, this job's not possible without them. Thank you, That's Melissa. Appreciate that perspective. Anyone else? It's the job of the, the town council to set policy. It's the job of the manager, which we have a wonderful manager, to manage the employees, to hire and to fire. And I, I think that um, everyone has their place. And when we have people that are micromanaging, then that just throws everything into a tizzy and everything goes down the wrong way. So I think that the council has their place of policy and then the manager, he takes care of our employees and we have a great staff and we appreciate you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. I would just echo what uh, Melissa said. So she took all my points and that's why I'm not gonna let her go first again. No. Um, you know, it's, it's really important that you recognize that our town manager is the boss. He's the one that's in charge. The council hired him to do a job and he does a great job. So I think as if any of us are elected, the first thing to do, to do would be prepared to come to the meetings. You know, don't assume something without having read all the material. 
I know Shane briefs the uh, uh, council before the meeting, so there should not be any of this long lingering debates about anything going on because it's gotten a little out of hand and I hope there's a way to fix it because it's embarrassing to the town. Thank you, Pete. Anyone else like to go? I have a couple follow-ups and so does well, Kelly. I will agree with all of you. It's an easy one. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. Oh, we were talking about taxation. Parking garage, we're going to tax Edward Jones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, the meetings, they're tough because people want to be heard. But I do agree. When the council attends the meeting, they need to be on top of their bank of knowledge on what is going to be discussed and not bring up sideline issues, address the issue, Take the recommendations from the department heads, the town manager, and move forward from there. So I agree with all of you. And being mayor, it's my job to su uh, supervise the meetings. I will continue to do my best to try to uh, shorten the length. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So in, in one sentence, how would you describe your leadership um, your leadership style in one sentence. Deep. Okay, I've done that. I've had you two to go. Doug. Deep. <laughs> I'm keeping him quiet. <laughs> I try to use my ears more than my mouth during council meetings. Uh, it's not oh, one sentence, sorry. <laughs> Nancy? To be a voice of reason for everybody. Everybody in town. That's Thank you. Leadership is first and foremost, listen to people, always be open to hearing what people have to say because they have a lot more knowledge sometimes than you think. That was a run on Pete. How'd you do in English? <laughs> 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 Melissa? <laughs> I am definitely a leader from the back. I'm not a forefront leader until I hit my line in the sand and then it's on. <laughs> but I, I am definitely one who was raised to, that you learn more sitting quietly in the back of the room than being the boisterous one in the front of the room. Thank you, Melissa. Yeah. Being in business for many years, you listen to your customers and you listen to your employees. That's what made your business operate, made it profitable and move forward. I agree with all of you. You listen to the citizens, they're your customers, and you listen to your town employees because they are your business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Mayor. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, we do the question. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> did you have another follow up question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the next portion of this is going to be the questions from the audience, so we'll begin reading those questions next. The necessary tension between promoting our economy, of which a very large part is, tur is a tourism industry, is our tourism industry, while keeping Blowing Rock a place we all want to keep living in full time, will require attention and willingness to think outside the box. How can the town council promote and protect both? Do you have specific practical ideas? So we're trying to we're trying to protect the tourism and also our full time residents as well. You, to me, you you have to be careful in doing your ordinances and your codes when you set that up to try and find that balance between residents and merchants and. With the, and trying to set that to where the tourism doesn't isn't your main thought also because you know you've got the the residents here and you've got everybody hollering tourism here so be careful when you're setting your policies and procedures that, that you're keeping both in mind and trying to keep that more fair and balanced between the two if I could ask a quick follow-up to that one of the things that um, a lot of the residents spoke of was wanting to maintain the character of our town 
Um, and uh, Nancy, you mentioned the change that's occurred since you were gone and moved back that you noticed. Would, you, would in order to help residents be able to enjoy their town and go to the merchants, um, would you all be willing to um, provide for special parking options for residents that are not available to tourists? Permitted parking, um, residents only parking, anything along those lines, would that be something that you would consider? I think that would be a perfect thing. I mean, just a couple of parking spaces somewhere because a lot of us can't even go downtown to just pick up a quick gift because we can't find a parking space. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a great idea. I have a, a sticker somewhere on your window that you had a you could park in these areas. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Nancy. Does anyone else want to respond to the question that Billy asked? I think first and foremost, we've got to focus on our citizens. If we don't have our citizens, we don't. We won't get the tourists. You people are what make Blowing Rock. And we've got to have our tourists, but uh, our tourists want to come to a friendly town. And uh, I think maybe permitted parking for residents, not a bad idea. Um, but that's, that's a tough nut to crack because we've got to have, we've got to have both. And that's a lot of that. We need the citizens' feedback on how best to, to, to move forward. So we all can move forward, keep our town unique and and happy. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I think when deciding things, there has got to be a lot of compromise in our town. Our town is very unique. We have full-time residents, we have part-time residents, and we have tourists. And all three are vital to our town. I mean, personally, I've been here 20 years, but if we didn't have tourists, I wouldn't have 20 restaurants to go choose from to go eat at because 1,200 of us can't support 20 restaurants. So, I mean, as residents, I know I can't survive without the tourist sector. So it's a constant compromise between the three sectors to keep harmony in our town. What's that aha answer to that? I think it's a constant changing answer <laughs> depending on what the question is of the day but I do believe there is a way to do it and maintain it and I think somewhat we also have to accept the fact we live in a tourist town and kind of alter our lives living in a tourist town <laughs> thank you Melissa thank you. anyone else want to address that before we move on to the next question briefly Pete yeah I would just say and echo everybody's comments that I think one of the most important things as I go around talking to people is they really don't feel that sometimes the town communicates in a way to let them know what's going on. And I think the town has to do a better job of communications to people. And um, so that's something that I would like to work on if, if I'm elected, thank you. Thank you, Pete. Chelsea. One other question from um, the audience. For each candidate, please tell us your number one priority. Please be specific, no general terms. Or, as an alternative, what do you see as the number one issue facing our town? I believe, Pete, when we were uh, discussing the first question where I gave examples, you wanted to talk about parking, but there may be some other issues that uh, were not discussed in those five questions. If you guys want to touch on one, Feel free to do that. First, number one priority or number one issue. I think parking is your number one issue right now in Blown Rock. Uh, also, to go back to touch a little on the question you said a minute ago, I've looked at maybe taking, say, Maple Street parking lot and taking either part of it or all of it and designating it to resident parking only. Uh, it's central to the banks, it's central to the post office, it's central to town hall. You know, that's the three major places the residents need to try to get to, pay their water bill, pick up their mail, go to the bank, you know. Uh, but it's also uh, the parking will be and it's, and it's going to be for a long time. Uh, fortunately, Bowen Rock has been found. 
and especially during the COVID period, it's really been found. So it's it's moved and it's it's caused the council to change a lot of things that we had picked as number one or number two to work on. It's it's changed things around. I mean, you you have to be able to to jump back and forth. And parking has jumped up to one of the number one issues. Thank you, Derek. Ms. Knox, anybody else want to answer that question? Yeah, I would say that the most important issue is the safety of our residents, i.e. having uh, the best 24-hour ambulance service that we can get. We've got to figure out how to pay for it. I think there are certain things that uh, can be done. We've talked about some of them, but Doug, I think it goes back, and I still have the question that I want to come back to at the end about how Wataga Medics actually works, because uh, in my mind, I, I have a hard time understanding how somebody can just keep renewing that contract without uh, putting it out to bid. Well, Pete, that's an excellent segue into the next question from the audience, which is, as a follow-up to Pete's question, how does the town go about getting the ambulance contract renewed? So if you could address that, I think it's phrased a little differently than how you were discussing it, but if you want to go ahead and address that, you may. Well, uh, Shane is uh, talking with the manager down in, um, in Boone. I suspect, I hope he has some success in doing that. Um, I think the other thing is that citizens of this town need to start going to the meetings down at the county and when they have their open three minute section to talk about something, let's have people go down there and start talking about the ambulance service. You know, let them know that we're not just some far off post that uh, they can take our money and maybe not give us back what we need. So I would suggest that we, we, we do that. Thank you, Pete. Anybody else want to address uh, their number one uh, issue or number one? Uh, I think as far as the number one issue in town, I think it depends on who you talk to at the time. I mean, for some people, it's going to be the speeding on 321. For some people, it's the ambulance. Others, it's the parking. I don't think you can say there is one for everybody in town. Um, one of the things for me, if I were to get elected, is I'd really like to see continuity and all the organizations in town working together. There's a lot of strife between the different organizations, whether it's a the chamber or the civic or you know whoever it is, working more closely together and working towards goals. I think that would help a lot in town. Thank you, Melissa. My main concern right now is the fact that our town, since COVID has hit, has been split all to pieces regarding the um, vaccines and our town employees. And I think it's a shame because we were called idiots after one of the town meetings because Tom and I are not vaccinated. We have had the monoclonal antibodies and we have had COVID, but neither of us can have the vaccine. Some people, it, it doesn't matter uh, whether it be they can't take the vaccine or they're afraid of the vaccine. I think it is totally ludicrous we are adults and we know how to take care of ourselves and we know how, you know, our employees in the town of Loin Rock, you know, they work for, um, for me, they, they take my garbage, I pay the taxes, all of that. And, and it is so unfair to try to take their livelihood away from them. Don't say to me, oh, it's unfair because they may kill me, no. My husband had a vaccine and he almost died. I had him at the Mayo Clinic from April until August and they said, never again can you take anything like this. So, you know, our town employees are valuable. I agree with Melissa. We have all of these different groups and everybody wants everything their way. 
the grandest thing that Charlie Sellers ever said at a town meeting was, everyone has an opinion, everyone thinks that they're right, but be respectful of everyone else's opinion. Don't throw somebody under the bus. Talk to them. That's a thing. Talk about things. And just know that the Lord is going to take care of us one way or the other. And if he decides to take Tom and Nancy Collins out of here because we haven't had our vaccine, he'll take us. But don't push that off on the whole community. And don't take our, our employees' time away from them. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy. Um, okay. Would anyone else like to address that question? Wow. You know, this, <laughs> what's really yeah. impressive about this is all the all the suggestions or comments have been made on their number one issue. As many things as what we've heard from the citizens. And I, I guess I will just follow up with one that um, 321. Well, 321 got completed. Uh, now we have a lot of traffic. I know our police department is working hard. Our town manager is working hard. Uh, we've got new signage ordered. I know that uh, there's discussions of hiring additional police officers. You know, it. Um, everybody knew that was going to happen. There was going to be speeding or whatever. And we all need to work with our police department and our town uh, moving forward and try to find solutions and resolutions to um, to solve that. That's going to be ongoing. That's fluid. I'm sorry, that's, that's just part of being a community. But um, we need to support our police, support our town, and uh, if we have suggestions, pass them on to our police chief uh, or our town manager. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I really just have one more question, but I, I will just tell you they gave me the COVID question. <laughs> so <All right. laughs> she was like, no, Billy, you do this question. So um, this question is in regards to COVID. Um, COVID-19 is a tough, evolving issue, very delicate issue. And um, so just know that um, we wanna be very delicate in the way we ask these questions and we wanna be very delicate to take, in, take into consideration everybody's emotions and everybody's experiences that they've gone through with COVID. Um, this question is from the audience. COVID-19 is a tough evolving issue with wide ranging and strong opinions. If town council is faced with weighing in on another COVID-19 decision, from what sources would you gather information in your decision-making process uh, regarding town policy? And if I could just tack on to that, I think sources being, um, do you follow the national trend based on national statistics? Do you look more at the, at the CDC? Do you look more at the local health department? How do you make your decisions based on our town and those numbers or uh, the state of North Carolina and the governor? There's a lot of sources of information out there. So. You just answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> no, I need you to pick one. <laughs> it, it's, it's pretty much what we have tried to do, is all of it. I mean, you have to. You, you, you listen to everyone that you're, uh, that's out there, but especially your local health director here in the county. Uh, you try and follow their leads. And we've tried to do it as a county or as you know all the towns do this mm -hmm. all the county does this but you have to it, it's a tough decision to make very tough and you're making decisions for people that this side agrees with you this side doesn't so you, it's a no-win situation on, on what you do but you try and make your judgment based on what you think is the best overall decision that you can make and it is based on, just like you had said, listening to everything that is out there. Thank you, Doug. Anybody else want to answer that question, or are you in agreement? Still in agreement. I think mainly, though, that the, the county, their, their figures, and the town of Boone, and the town of Blowing Rock, I don't know if anything's done with COVID and Blowing Rock. But um, I think for us, yes, you need to see the overall picture. But what's going on in our county, I think we really need to be aware of that when we're making decisions like this. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, if there are no, many, uh, no more answers to this, um, we're going to give each of you uh, a minute for your closing statements. So whoever wants to go first. 
I'll go first. <laughs> <Thank> Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. No. Thank you very much for coming and listening. If anyone has any questions, I'll be glad to talk with you afterwards. But I love Blowing Rock, and I want everybody to work together. My mama and daddy taught us that. So please, if you have questions, talk to me. I'm not avoiding anyone. I didn't go to certain things that were done because I was out of town because our son has finally made it big in Nashville and we were able to go hear his concert. So that's why we, did, we were not here. So I didn't have to explain to anybody that, but I want you to know I'm here for Blowing Rock. My doors are open. We need to, to feed our community, we need to love our community, and we need to be a part of our community and support every single one of our council members. And if you choose to elect me, that's great. I'll love it. And if you choose not to, I'll still love you. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Nancy. Go ahead, Pete. <laughs> short, sweet, and simple. I want to help my town. I want to help the citizens of it. And kind of like Nancy, if you like me, you like me. If you don't, you don't. But I'm not going anywhere. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, anyway. Melissa. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. And um, it's great to have this turnout because I know that uh, citizens, uh, sometimes they have other important things to do, but this is really important. Having served on a number of boards and commissions uh, here the last number of years, I'm very keenly aware of what goes on, what needs to be done, and my background in leadership provides me that opportunity that if you select me uh, to the council, I will bring all of that to the forefront and help the mayor and uh, the manager uh, get things going. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. Doug? I've been fortunate enough to have lived through a lot of different blowing rocks that many of y'all aren't familiar with. And though there are places and things that are gone that I miss dearly, it seems that each version of blowing rock has been able to make itself better. So I say if the, the old adage is that if you look to the past to predict the future, then I see the same good old blowing rock, only better. I ask that you vote for me, Doug Matheson, and thank each and every one of you for being out here tonight. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. <clears throat> Mayor? Wow. First, I want to say my thanks to the chamber and the citizens and those that attended this evening. I also want to thank the citizens and the town employees for their support over the past four years. Politics was new to me and still is. Uh, you know, it's really different than business but yet it's not because you're still serving people and you're serving customers. I'd like to thank those that I've had the pleasure of serving with over the past four years, Virginia Powell, Sue Sweeting, Jim Steele. And that does not mean they're leaving. I'm just going in order. Uh, Doug Matheson, Albert Yant, and David Harwood. It's really neat when you get so many smart people in one room. And um, I do want to thank the citizens, and I hope I will be able to serve our community for another two years. Thank you so much. So if thank you, you, you could join me in a round of applause. I think they did a great job. And uh, please stay afterwards uh, for some uh, time speaking with the candidates, meet and greet. Uh, and thank you so much for those that ask questions. We appreciate your participation. Thank you, everybody.